use items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. Today's guest isn't a mystery to those who have followed WDW News Today over the years. The site's founder and CEO, Tom Corliss, has been on the Disney parks beat for over a decade, and he's seen both the parks and how people cover it change dramatically in that time. Tom was nice enough to sit down with me to talk about how his family's love of Disney World rubbed off on him, what it was like to work for the Disney Props Auction House Theme Park Connection, and how Imagineering has responded to his own reporting. All of that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Tom Corliss, thanks so much for coming on DreamFinders. Oh, thanks for having me. So for many listening, uh, clearly you're a regular to their ears um, and eyes, thanks to Walt Disney World News Today's website and podcasts. Um, But my hope is today we might get a little bit of understanding uh, of the man behind the curtain and sort of the operation a little bit. So um, one thing I was curious about was, you know, how long has um, WDWNT been going around at this point? Uh, We started on July 8th, 2007. So we are over 11 years at this point. Uh, I don't know when this is airing, but uh, we're over over 11 years at the time we're, we're recording this. There's been several waves uh, of Disney news online. Um, and if I remember my my weird web Disney history, I, I, you guys kind of came in at the tail end of the first wave or how does that all how does that all work out? Tell us a little bit about Disney online news. That seems reasonable. I I think first wave is probably like WDW Magic and All Ears, um, that group. And I, I think that's fair. We came in, I I would say, at the end of that whole thing. Um, and things were very different back then. Like you were lucky if those sites posted three or four times a week. Mm. Never mind a day, which is you know uh, that's that's low that's low for us now. Um, and I just felt like I would go on vacation to Disney. Once I got in, like 2003, I started, we were very late to have internet in my household it, for, for whatever reason. So I'd have to use it at school usually. But then like 2003, we finally set up AOL in the house. And so I just happened to search Disney stuff and fell down a rabbit hole and found all this, you know, this Disney World or Disney Parks online community. And I think the thing that surprised me is I'd go on vacation for a week or so, and I feel like I'd notice a lot of things that weren't reported or no one was talking about. Um, And that's kind of what forums, I guess, did a bit back then. Mm -hmm. But even then, people were starting to to not use forums anymore. It was feeling sort of antiquated by the time the, the site was starting. And so... I ended up taking a uh, there was a there was a group on WW Magic who wanted to start their own newsletter thing, and I was going to school for journalism, so I thought it'd be good to to do some fun writing that I actually enjoyed, you know, in my free time, and I did that, and it only lasted like two months, if even I don't remember exactly how long it lasted, um, but there was a lot of feedback, and a lot of people, you know, had opinions on what I was writing, and I liked that. And I liked writing about Disney. And so the, when they sort of vanished and the newsletter stopped, I immediately started looking into, well, what, maybe maybe I should just do something. Mm. Um, and the thing that came to mind is how I, I would be kind of annoyed if I went on vacation and realized like there I, – I think you could post at least something every day. I think there's enough going on. Um, and that's where I came up with WW News Today with the idea being um, – What if we actually posted something every day? So at least you knew when you checked every day there was going to be something new to read. You you did not expect us to take a day off. And so every day you'd come to the site and see something of of some sort um, posted. So were people just basically pushing out press releases that Disney had already pushed out? Was that sort of the normal news coming out since it wasn't so regular? Or like, what was the concentration? Because I think about now, you know, if, a, if a, sometimes if a new muffin comes out at 
Epcot <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's like someone get down there. Like we got to do it. Um, that didn't happen back then. Fun fact, and it, it, and I reflected on this a lot recently. Uh, menus didn't change that often mm. back then. And it, to put things in perspective, the Brown Derby had mostly the same dinner menu for the first 20 years of my life. <laughs> I I went there for years and always got the goat cheese ravioli. That was what I always had. And then finally, someday they were like, we're going to try doing seasonal menus now. And that was earth shattering. That wasn't a thing that a lot of restaurants at Disney World were doing, especially in a theme park. Like maybe California Grill, even then it's questionable, but... Food didn't change. Like you, you went to starring roles at studios and they had chocolate croissant, regular croissant, muffin, fruit. That was it. Mm -hmm. Bagel. That, that was the menu. It did not change in your lifetime. There was not cupcake of the month and all those things. So things, at least in the food side, things didn't change that often back then. Is it, is it because of social media that there is the desire to have more options for people to showcase? Or is it just a, is there a grander American food culture that sort of wants to try new things? What, what do you think made them determine that this was, uh, and clearly it was good for Disney news, but what, <laughs> what, what made them make this choice? Well, it's good for business, which I think is why mm. Disney does it. I think it is that social media and you want to share like, oh, look at this amazing thing I had. I think it is that food culture. There are people – a lot of people call themselves foodies now and you got to take pictures of your food. And that's not exclusive to, to Disney. If people go to Disney parks. That's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think the third thing is Disney finally understood that they were not just – um, dealing with vacationers. They had a very large amount of locals and people – um, who came on a regular basis. And if they kept things continually fresh, people would spend more money. I think the thought was, um, oh, there's there's new things to try. I will go to this place. And I, you know, I, I and I think there's sort of an internal competition now between, you know, restaurants and such where they, they you know, they're all fighting for the same money. And so all of them are kind of one upping each other. Um, and, and I think chefs like the attention. I think all of them want to be the next thing talked about on social media. And then all of them want to be the next Dole Whip donut or, you know, whatever other crazy thing they're coming up with. Right. Which is at least good. I mean, it, as, as we've said, it's, it's good for the news business. And my question is a little bit about how you got interested in the news business to begin with. Were you uh, interested in journalism in high school? What got you into – was it your passion for journalism that sort of led to reporting on Disney or was it your passion of Disney sort of leading into desiring to do more journalism? D journalism and Disney never coalesced until the day I found out about the newsletter. I did not connect those two things. Um, I had bounced around where whether I wanted to write for a newspaper or do sports broadcasting or some sort of broadcasting. I had bounced between those things forever. But that that was the realm I always knew I wanted to work in. I think even from a very young age, um, for whatever reason, I just – liked writing and uh, I also liked that broadcast side of things. I was fascinated. Um, I don't know. There were, and, and I think like movies and television shows that I had seen growing up um, affected that. Mm. Um, and I think like my, my mother loved the Mary Tyler Moore show and I was fascinated by like what happens behind the scenes. Um, I'm trying to think of, there's a couple of movies that uh, definitely put me down that path to, um, I'm trying to think of the name. Broadcast news or yeah. network. I guess it's some, some network, days. Network, thank you. Some yeah, days network. Disney Twitter feels like network. Have you ever seen that movie? So <laughs> Yeah, so there was, I don't know. that I was just fascinated by that. And then besides that, I, I think, um, I don't know. I just enjoyed writing. And the, the two never connected until like 2007. And then, because uh, I guess the newsletter was only a couple months before the website started. Um, and I, I realized at that point that, people were doing this professionally. Like I, it never dawned on me that all ears and all those people were doing these things for a living. Mm. I just thought these were things that existed. I never really looked into, well, who's the person behind this? What do they do? You know, what, what is their day job thinking they had a day job? Um, yeah, n none of that pieced together until I was already in the belly of the beast. Yeah. So let's go all the way back. Where, where did you grow up? Uh, Bronx, New York. Okay, so you're a New York boy, um, but it sounds like you were also a Disney family. So you guys made the trip quite often. 
I was born into it. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> um, my cousin Michael was born in 83, uh, and they were already going. And before he was born, they they still grew up with Disney. They, my, my parents were children of the 50s. Um, they went to the New York World's Fair. Mm. Uh, they uh, went to Disney World for the first time in 83 before Michael was born um, on a trip. Uh, they were going to the New Orleans World's Fair was that year. Um and it just so happened they they combined that with a trip to their first trip to Disney World, which is a year after Epcot opened and stuff. And I, I guess they fell in love with it. And then uh, Michael was born, and they started going several times a year. And by the time I was born, they were already going on several long weekends a year. And I just, you know, I I grew up and it was there. It was never a decision to be made. It just was in my life. So in some ways, it's probably really hard to remember your first trip. I would imagine. Oh be impossible it was uh, it was december of of uh, 88 i was four months old <laughs> there's there's no way yeah i mean i can see what draws you to it knowing you but what drew your parents why i mean even when i think about um disney at that time it i mean there were things opening for sure um and and things were going on but it wasn't even as like we're doing a bunch of stuff different every year what what drew them back all the time I, I think because Michael was born, there was a, he was the first kid in the family. He was the first of the there were my mother's side was a family of five. Um, and that was the first child to have a child. Mm. And so there was now a baby in the family. Um, and I think they already were Disney people. They, they being born in 1954 and 55, um, you you watched Walt Disney on television every Sunday. Um, and they had been to the World's Fair and remembered how amazing all the things that Disney did there were. And I, I think all that just uh, snowballed. And I think I think they just they went and they had such a great time. And by the time I was born and then I loved it as a kid. So there was no reason to stop going. Everyone enjoyed it. Were you a resort family or were you a hotel family nearby? Uh, when I was younger, we, we once stayed off property and I think my parents hated it so much, <laughs> uh, that never happened again. Um, the, the, my cousin's family has a, a fair amount of money. They ran a construction business. Um, and so more often than not, they would elect to stay at the Grand Floridian and we would be invited to stay with them. Um, and so we stayed at the Grand a lot. We stayed um, before they fell in love with the Grand Floridian. I know we bounced between the contemporary and the Polynesian. You have to remember back then there was only a handful more options mm -hmm. beyond those. And everybody looks at those now and is like, oh, my God, those are super expensive and they're deluxe. That that wasn't a thing then. There was barely any other hotels in those first couple of years. Um, I think the only other ones were like Caribbean Beach. And then slowly the early years of my life, like like Yacht and Beach came on board and all those things. But but uh, early on, those were your only options anyway. Mm. But, but I think we mostly bounced – um, between those three. And then once they finally stayed at the Grand Floridian that my, my, everyone in the family fell in love with it. And that's where I always, for the most part, ended up. I have these like, um, when I think back of going at a very, very young age to the parks, I, I have these like blurs, um, shapes and colors, but nothing that I can put with it. And sometimes I feel like I need to go to a therapist and figure out if what I'm remembering is carousel progress or dream flight or what that what is going on. <laughs> because you were there so early, do you have these little reflections that you're like, I remember a feeling or I remember a, like an aspect of a thing, but I, I can't put it all together? Or does it just because you went so often all sort of mold in? to uh, eventually mold into a thing it probably molded into a thing but the the interesting thing is i have photographic memory hmm. and there are early memories that have are stuck in my mind and i've always found that really kind of creepy and weird <laughs> um i remember my father holding me up over the construction walls at splash mountain before it had opened wow like i have a a vivid photograph memory in my head of the structural steel for Splash Mountain. And I mean, I was, I was what, three or four years old. You were snooping around at a very young age. Yeah. Right. See, I was, I always, I could blame my father for everything, <laughs> uh, getting into pin trading and, you know, wanting to look over construction walls, everything can be blamed on them in the end. So was it always journalism or did you have aspects for, um, I mean, you mentioned magazines and newspapers. Did you have aspects or desires for things like books or comics or was it always just uh, more of the nonfiction stuff? Uh, comic books were a thing for a period, but I think it's just cause my father enjoyed them. I read a couple, but it wasn't like an affinity. I, I hated reading books. 
That was not a thing I did. Um, they would assign books for school, and that was like the worst thing that could happen. Um, I don't know. I, I certainly read uh, the Sunday paper would come. I would I would look at that quite a bit. Um, I don't know. Those things didn't interest me. I, I grew up with television and movies and and print media. I didn't I didn't I don't know. Books didn't excite me. I I, I know it sounds. It doesn't sound very intellectual. It's like, I hate books. I'd rather watch movies. And that, well, I know. that was my thing is I just love it. I right. just felt like we had progressed to the medium where we could now show people all these amazing mm. things that we could think up. And I I think I was always just more intrigued to see what, what the vision the person had in their head was. I mean, it sounds like you were a smart kid. You were reading the newspaper. So, like, you, you had me be. <laughs> I, 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 um like okay so you you grew up in New York and you I'm assuming you were writing this newsletter and even the if I remember correctly the origins of uh the first couple of years of WWNT that was happening in New York right yeah no i didn't i uh, i've been in Orlando for 5 years now but the no the the first years of the site i still lived at home i was in college how did that distance affect the reporting we got people very quickly to come on board. Um, there wasn't a lot out there. There were all the big sites. And I think there was a lot of people out there who, who suddenly like at the same time I was realizing it was a thing. There were other people out there realizing that, Oh, you, you can do this. Like, it's not something you have to have. Like you don't have to have some special access to do this, like to start a website and to go to the parks and report on things is, is not some, you know, exclusive club. Like it, it can be done. And so what I did very quickly was just started looking for people like that who were in Orlando, like feet on the ground. And I was like, do you, you know, do you think this would be cool? Do you want to send in photo reports? You want to do things. Um, and almost immediately we found some people, there was this guy, Jose, a bear, um, and like immediately he was sending stuff in like he thought it was just such a cool idea, such a cool thing to contribute to. And so he was sending me a high definition video of like the, the soft opening of Spaceship Earth because that was the year oh, sure. they redid Spaceship Earth, Siemens. Um, and he would send me construction updates of Bay Lake Tower and, um, you know, and throughout that first year, I remember like we we were the first – uh, video on the internet of Toy Story Mania. There, there were people, and then so I, you know, we went from one or two photographers and videographers, and I think uh, eventually I had like eight or nine Walt Disney World people who were going. You know, between the combination of them, several day, I think seven days a week we had somebody in the park, and that's you know for years and years that just snowballed until we you know kept getting more attention. Did you feel? isolated from the overall Disney uh, news community because it was all here in Orlando or did because of online presence, did you feel like it was easy to connect I don't, it? I don't think it was. I don't think it was here. I don't know that any of them lived here at that point. I think, I think inside the magic Ricky lived here. Um, I, and attractions, but I don't know that anyone else did. I think, Everybody else was still living in, in – uh, several people were still in the Northeast and other places. I don't think any uh, – I don't think many site owners or people at sites had moved – had picked up and moved yet. I don't think it had progressed to that point yet. Did you – like was it a, a pretty easy decision to move down here to Florida or was it some – I mean what – I mean it seems like things are working out and you have people on the ground. Why finally make that leap? Was it because others were making it or you just thought it was time? Well, it was a personal thing and, and I know now like given the success of the site, people would probably assume I moved here because the site was really doing great. The site was doing well. My intention was never to make money. My intention was never for that kind of success. I wanted the site to do well. I wanted to be, you know, um, my outlook in life is if you're going to do something, you should try to be the best at it. And that was that was my goal. My goal was never to make a cent or any of those other things. So it was the the site was still a hobby in 2013. It just was an all consuming <laughs> hobby um, that I cared probably way too much about um, personal things in my personal life. Mm. are what made me move. I had met someone and she lived here. 
Uh, and we had been in a relationship for six months and it was getting hard to do the long distance thing. And she offered that I could move in. Um, and I made a deal with my parents where I was given basically, uh, I just, I just graduated a couple months before, uh, from college. Uh, and I made a, and I wasn't really finding work in my field because everyone was firing everybody or downsizing. Uh, so there wasn't, it's hard to start in New York. New York is is the big time for for broadcasting and journalism. You those are not jobs you generally walk into. You have to be very lucky if you do. It was great for internships. It wasn't good for actually starting a career. Um, and so uh, the decision was made. I, I they gave me enough money that would last me like a month or two and to see if I could find a job to get rolling down here. At least something just to get the ball rolling. Um, and so I came down here and just started looking for work and uh i originally was going to work at target that was going to be my starting job just to have something to make some money while i figure things out uh and the day before i was supposed to uh enter or the day before i was supposed to start at target I already got hired by target the day before orientation um i ended up at uh in winter garden in this warehouse at theme park connection doing an interview and I did the interview and literally I got home from the interview and the phone rang and they said immediately, would you like to come work for us? And I thought that was, I was like, well, target sounds boring and terrible. Uh, if I can make, you know, slightly better money and work around Disney stuff, I mean, that's somewhere I can thrive. And I thought that was just seemed like a really cool thing. It's a warehouse filled with abandoned Disney ride vehicles and, and attraction props and it just felt like where I should be. And so I took that job. And uh, at that point, I was officially living in Orlando. Um, what is something – you mentioned Theme Park Connection. What What is something wild that came through those doors while you were there that you were just impressed by? Oh, my God. There's so many, so many things. Um, we had a bunch of paneling from a hydrolator from the Living Seas. That was really neat. We had the original maquette – for Figment spaceship that appeared in the Centorium oh, shop in Epcot Center. That was my first week. That's why that one sticks out so much. Because in the grand scheme of things, that's probably not one of the 10 or 20 coolest things we ever had in the time I was there. But that really sticks out just because it was my first week. No one in the office could figure out what it was. And they brought it into the room where we were writing up eBay listings. And he brings it in and immediately I go, that's Figment spaceship. He's, he says, what are you talking about? Figment didn't have a spaceship in the ride. I go, it wasn't from the ride. It was in the store. And I immediately pulled up the reference photo and everyone, of course, <laughs> was impressed. Also, my my I think the second week there we had the we had the solo, not the solo. So there was like a submarine type vehicle with claws from Horizons. It was sort of in the background and uh, it had been sitting outside for a long time and we had to flip it onto a flatbed pr uh, truck. And when we did that, all the legs broke. <laughs> I was like, well, we destroyed the last uh, intact piece of Horizons <laughs> on the market. That's great. Um, but all sorts of cool things. The original model for the Indiana Jones adventure, the Imagineer had turned into a board game for his kids. They didn't know what to do with it. He took it home. He's like, I'm going to turn it into a board game for the kids to play with. Um, that was insanely cool. Uh, the pitch book for the Switzerland pavilion and that we've shared now. I mean, that was, that was a great thing about theme park connection they saw how good the site was doing and they always thought it was cool to let me mm. like do stuff with some of the stuff that would come in. Uh, and so the Switzerland book, uh, was one of those. And then the other one that comes to mind is Disney mountain, which was the five story, uh, hotel and entertainment complex. They were going to build between studios and Epcot, which eventually became the Epcot resort area. Uh, all kinds of stuff like that. How does stuff come in? Because it, it for me, it, well, they don't exist anymore. Right, of course, of course. Was it just people on the street had stuff? Was it dumpster diving by other people? Like how how does a, a thing from Horizons uh, end up in the warehouse? It was a it was a combination of things. So high end collectors who were getting rid of stuff. Uh, and we're buying stuff from us. So they knew if there was something they wanted to get rid of, we were the people to go to. Um, there were obviously, uh, Walt Disney world at that point has been open for over 40 years. So there's a lot of people who could have 30 or 40 years with the company. You get older, your significant other who worked for the company passes away. You don't really know what to do with everything. 
a quick Google search, the first place you're going to find where you can sell Disney stuff is going to be Theme Park Connection. Um, so it, it, all different things, but the, those were the, the main ways things come in. Or just random pe people sometimes would just end up with Theme Park stuff and they didn't really know what to do with it. And they just would do a quick Google search and be like, I've heard you guys buy theme park stuff. Can I bring this in? And we would, uh, you know, look at it and give them a price and buy it. And then you'd have Disney legends come in and sell memorabilia. Correct. I mean, just, Oh, we, yeah, just absolutely. all sorts of people. Yeah. So, um, who would come in all the time? Uh, Sully would come in all the time. Um, and every week he'd, he'd get rid of a couple things, but the cool thing was he'd come like do signings at the store for like big events and he'd bring his actual legends mm. statue. For those who don't, for those really who don't know, that would be, uh, uh, William Sullivan, who was VP over at, um, Magic Kingdom for several years. Um, plus a ton yeah. of other and stuff. And also opened, opened, it's opened every, it's a small yes. world from the world's fair onward. Uh, you know that he was operations man at Disneyland and Walt trusted him with theme park operations immensely. Um, you move to Florida and what I'm curious about is not Disney culture at the moment that we're about to get into that, but I I'm curious about Florida culture as a New Yorker. What was the thing that you just, you couldn't wrap your mind around when it came to Florida culture? Thing I can't wrap my mind around. I, I think we've been coming here so much that nothing was really a surprise. I think I was, especially the last couple of years. At that point, I have, you know, people start working for the website and the website's not for money. So we're not doing it as a business. People are doing it. Um, some people are doing it to, to advance socially and make friends within their fandom. So uh, I had friends who were moving to Orlando from Chicago and he liked the website. He's like, oh, I'd love to help now that I'm going to move to Orlando. And through him doing stuff for the site, that was an opportunity for us to become friends and become friends with the other people on the site. And it just became sort of this big friend group who also did this website. Mm. Um, and so because of that, I would – towards the end, I was coming so frequently because I had people to stay with who lived here. Um, and so I was already seeing life outside of the Disney right. bubble. I had already at that point seen enough of it. So I don't know if anything was shocking. I think kind of understood how the town is. Um, the more interesting thing to me is sort of the, the attempt at culture <laughs> that has happened in more recent years. Like the, uh, oh, we love soccer now just because we have a soccer team. And I'm like, uh, all right. <laughs> it is an interesting – and coming from – of course, I live here in Florida as well. It, it's an interesting kind of dichotomy of um, people who have lived here forever. Um, you have, you know um, – uh, I'm trying to remember what they call them, but you know, people coming snowbirds, they have snowbirds coming down and, and, and yeah. coming in and out. It's a very transitionary sort of place. Uh, and at the same time, it's weird to go to your grocery and see like British foods, um, on the shelf because they know what mm. their audience is. You know, it's such a, it's such a weird little area, central Florida, because yeah. of that kind of stuff. I, I'm not surprised that, um, uh, some people would, find that the, people would love to think, I think that the culture isn't Disney, but there's no way of getting away from the fact that there was orange groves and nothing. And then there was Disney. They didn't exist before. Yeah. yeah it's like, and I mean, it's, it's the same thing with Anaheim um, where it, it just wasn't a thing before Disney was, was put here. That is your culture. And I know some people want to escape that. I, I kind of feel like we should embrace it. It is a, This is such a weird and wild and special mm. town. There is nothing like this anywhere else. This this kind of uh, situation doesn't exist. You, you go into a McDonald's and you might see 40 people dressed as safari tour guides. <laughs> um, you know, one time we went to a McDonald's and there was the whole cast of star tours <laughs> back when there was the bright orange jumpsuit, mind you. So just these bright orange jumpsuits all over. And it's, it's just such a weird and interesting place. And that's, that's the thing I do like about it. I, I don't like when this town tries to get away from, from mm. what it is. I think it, we should embrace and enjoy that on a weekend. If you want to go, you know, 
to Asia or to Africa or, you know, to Hollywood in 1939 or whatever, you have that opportunity in this town or you can go to Hogwarts or Pandora or um, there is always something to do here. And it's and, and, and even not just theme parks, because the theme parks draw so many tourists, there's always something crazy and weird happening, uh, you know, somewhere in the tourist areas or elsewhere. Um, so it, it's great because we, we have – all the stuff you could really probably want um, from a big city, but then also all this weird, wacky tourist stuff because the tourist uh, crowd draws in, you know, all this uh, higher end stuff. I think it's it's really interesting and, and cool. I I think it's an interesting town. Let's um let's dive a little bit into that culture that we want them to appreciate so much and talk a little bit about the parks. Your um reporting. Uh, has led you to understand sort of the news ecosystem that happens around Disney. Um, That includes journalists and, you know, um, style bloggers and YouTubers and anybody that's got an Instagram, (laughs) right? I mean, it's it's done a lot of evolution over uh, the last decade. So my question is, like, how has how has the news ecosystem changed uh, around Disney uh, since you've been involved with it? It's completely different. It's in no way what it was. Uh, when I started. So the the, the slow evolution, um, I think, was when we started, like I said before, I think people posted, like Magic posted like three or four times a week. Um, And then we started posting every day. Um, And we didn't get any real traction, I think, till like summer of 2008. I think we started to get noticed a little bit. Um, And I think that's when we started to see more people come around who posted at least at once a day, um, like attractions magazine started, um, and inside the magic started posting more. And I started to see suddenly everyone was posting seven days a week. Um, and then suddenly people were posting more than once a day and it just kept building and building. And I, I think, uh, you, you gotta remember Twitter started, um, the year when we when we launched the site that year so so the world started to move faster once twitter came in and facebook became more um you know relevant um and with social media the dawn of social media which is right at the start of wdwnt um that's when things started moving faster the same way and i'm sure it's the same way when the you know the internet came to being the world started moving much faster news you know, uh, happened at a much faster rate. Um, and then we started seeing that with the advent of social media, that, that news started happening faster. And then more recently, the, the YouTube and Instagram thing, which, um, YouTube, I understand Instagram still boggles <laughs> my mind. I don't, I don't understand that. I had to bring in people, to understand Instagram for me, basically, Um, because obviously there's a value there. There are a ton of people using Instagram and I, just because I don't understand it doesn't mean it's not worth anything. And I think that's, that was the thing I didn't, I didn't want to be the Orlando Sentinel. I didn't want to be print media uh, uh, places and broadcast media and fall behind. I always wanted to make sure if something new was going to happen, I wanted us to to be on there. Like, obviously, we're going to keep doing what we're doing already. But if there is something new we need to get with, we're going to get with it because I do not want to. I mean, All Ears, a fantastic site. But in their existence, I mean, we saw their rise and decline. I didn't I don't want to see that decline. That decline would make me very sad. Um that is, I I like to see forward progress every month. Even before this was um, making a dollar, I always like to see the traffic up month to month. I don't want to make any, you know, I don't want to go backwards at any point. Um, so yeah, I just, so whatever you got to jump on, you jump on it. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, um, you know, you, you tried. And, th- and there have been certainly things, you know, I remember Vine and. Uh, would form spring and all kinds of weird things that came out that we tried momentarily didn't stick around. You never know what's going to stick. And uh, Instagram and YouTube, we held out probably a little longer than we should have YouTube. We were really late to the game and I still regret that, Um, but we're getting there and uh, Instagram sort of the same thing, but we've made really quick progress. on So uh, the thing that I think is interesting about the reporting that you, and, and of course the site does is it's sort of, 
it's sort of business reporting, but it's very much also entertainment reporting. And I think the thing that's mm. really kind of interesting about it is either of those two categories have multiple things that they would cover, but you really have this like one-on-one relationship with one of the largest and most powerful companies in the world, but but clearly one company. So what sort of relationship have you had with the Disney Corporation? And, and what is that balance for you as a reporter and you know, even, you know, I, I think it's very, fairly obvious that some people will, will sort of work a little closer with the company than others. What has always been mm-hmm. your sort of ethos when it comes to that? I'll, I'll give you the full story because I don't, I don't think you can understand um, our relationship with the company if you don't have the, the story of us working with and not working with Disney. Um, we started as a thing for fun. I never in a million years thought we were going to be on a media list. Um, and then I think it was 2009, maybe 08, probably 2009. Um, yeah, because it was after American Idol we didn't go to that one. Um, sometime in 2009, we started getting media invites and I just out of nowhere, I thought like maybe they made a mistake. Maybe <laughs> they thought we were WDW today, like the podcast. Remember when that was a thing? Kids? Uh, and, uh, I thought they was a mistake, but they were like, no, you come to the event. I was like, I don't know how we do media. And I'm not here at the time. So I ended up sending people who were local to stuff and we started going to some media events and there was, um, a couple of years where we went to like 2009, 2010, um, and even 11 and 12, we were doing stuff. And then suddenly we were getting Disneyland media events cause we had Disneyland mm-hmm. news today also. And we were getting invited to the big media events, um, there. And that was, that blew my mind. Uh, my first real big media event was the world of color mm-hmm. premiere. Because I didn't, I was never here when the Florida stuff was happening. So I think I did like the ESPN Wide World of Sports thing, but that was ESPN <laughs> paid for that, and it wasn't in a park or anything. That doesn't really mean anything yeah. to me. Uh, the debut of a nighttime show meant something to me, and so we did the World of Color premiere, and I was blown away. There's celebrities everywhere, and we're working a carpet, and we're at the first show ever, and we're getting all this, you know, free stuff, and it's great. And, and but my my thought process in that is never. I never walked into that thinking, well, I better be nice because otherwise Disney isn't going to invite me anymore. My my going into that is is I'm here. Be, obviously, be professional. I mean, that you're, you're there uh, as an invited guest. I mean, you don't go to events and try to cause trouble or anything. I know people people would like you to believe things like that happen. That's never been a thing. Um, uh, but my thought was never like, oh, if the show is bad, I have to, you know, uh, I have to say it was good so I can keep media credentials. So that was never a thought in my mind at any point. We were always very honest. I, I think we got lucky for a while that the things were very good. Uh, <laughs> so the reviews always were very positive. So World of Color, we were like, oh, this is amazing. You need to see this. Um, and then even all the way up into the the coolest thing I ever got to do and will never be topped for me is the, the cars land media event. Um, because I loved cars and I was so excited for that, that, that meant everything to me. Um, and yeah, obviously again, that got a good review. I don't know who would give that a bad review. Um, and so we never, I never thought we were going to be removed or anything. And then, uh, I think sometime in 2012, we stopped getting Florida invites. Uh, and then everything completely cut off when we posted. Uh, we got a, a document of some kind that detailed Disney Springs before that was announced to the public. Uh, and we posted that. And Disney never contacted me, never said anything to me. Um, we just uh, – I had even received like a save the date for the Mickey and the Magical Map mm. Uh, press event in California and then that happened and I never got the like actual event information and like an, like an idiot, I emailed them at some point going like, oh, we're, am I going to get like the actual invite at some point? We're getting kind of late here. And then uh, like a couple days later, it dawned on me that, yeah, that's not common. Um, yeah, the Disney Springs thing, it was all over the news here and everything. That was, I think that was the moment when WWNT became what it is now. I I think we had, we had growth over the first five years of the website, um, but everything really 
got crazy after mm. that point. That's when everything exploded. Uh, and like I had a, there was like uh, the head of, of internet security for Imagineering uh, flew to Florida. I was like, would you like to have breakfast with me? And I was like, sure. And they asked me a million questions about where the document came from. And I'm like, well, you know, I went to school for journalism. You know, we don't, you don't sell out your sources. You can't really do that. And I gave them enough information to where I thought it was at least helpful for them. Uh, because we got it in a really roundabout way. Like the story I was given, um, and I don't know if it's true or not. It probably wasn't. But the story I was given was that an Imagineer uh, went and did a presentation at school and left a flash drive behind. That was a story I was given. Um, I never got the name of the Imagineer or anything. The amazing thing was we posted that document and I go to the meeting with the guy and the guy goes, well, the, the reason we're so interested is because uh, this document is clearly our project. Uh, but at Imagineer, we don't have this. Huh. We don't have this art. We don't have like this document, but this is very clearly our project. <laughs> um, so that was the other thing in all of that that was amazing was they they had to rush together an announcement bob Iger was flown to florida they had a presentation with the model in the like the back room upstairs at splitsville um and so that was that was the first time i understood that we could have some serious impact i mean that's sort of a faustian <laughs> bargain i mean did you have a knowledge of i mean did you go in it sort of just like we're excited to have this info or did you sort of realize like i can pull the trigger on this um and definitely get like some attention for my site or but the, the problem with that is i might end up on you know the the naughty list I didn't know there was a naughty list. I thought you progressed to a point where you were big enough that they realized you reached an audience they needed mm -hmm. to reach. And I figured that's how that works. Um, just think about it, like the Orlando Sentinel, you know, the, the company wasn't ready to announce Walt Disney World. The Sentinel, you know, uh, posted the, or uh, wrote the piece and published it. And that forced Disney to announce something. The Sentinel still went right. to Disney media events right. after that, right? So that was my that was my line of thought. Um, but I didn't. I wasn't even thinking that. That my my thought process was: here's this great document about this unannounced project, and we could tell the world that this project is happening. And that's my thought was: that's mm -hmm. the job. That's we are we are Walt Disney. We're Disney World News today. We have to give you the news. I have been handed news about mm -hmm. Disney World. I have to share this. And of course, obviously, you know, with that story, it wasn't as big of a deal. You have to protect the people you get the story from. Um, and that one, there wasn't really anyone to protect because it came from such a weird place. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was never, I, my thought was not that, I knew Disney could be upset. I didn't think um, they would go silent. I thought for sure I'd hear from somebody who's like, we're unhappy you shared this. I was never contacted. Uh, they just basically cut off contact. That was the way they decided to deal with the situation. You know, and I think what's, when I think about um, that ability to break news on Disney, what I think is very interesting from a fan perspective and, and from someone who clearly follows Disney Twitter is the reaction to breaking news before Disney has an opportunity to do it. Sometimes fans really flip out about the idea that a news organization would be so bold. So do you think people are, well, let's, let's clarify that. Let's clarify that. You're saying fans. Um, I, I would think it's mostly cast members. Hmm. That's what I have come to realize. Um, and, and, Nathan, I think you know. I think it's well known. Uh, I have had my fair share of spats with people. You don't say. In the community. Yeah. Um, and I've realized that all, almost all the spats I've ever had about the early release of information have been with people who work for the company. It's usually people who work for the company. Um, it's usually very easy to tell. Usually their Twitter account says, my, my uh, thoughts do not, uh, <laughs> right. whatever. Not those of the Walt Disney Company, or they, or they'll say like, uh, you know, movie writer, blah blah blah. Um, more often than not, the the because obviously as a fan, that that is what fandom is. Right. That's that's what fans love to do. Fans love to speculate about what's next. I mean, that's and I think especially in the world of theme parks, I think more than anything, I think there is this fascination 
Um, and it's the same fascination with things that are never built, but the, the fascination of what could be in the creative process and how attractions and ideas and lands come together. I think that is the most appealing part of, of loving theme parks is, is the development process. Now, a pet peeve of yours, though, is when websites or reporting don't hold a level of standards sort of uh, that would be considered, uh, whether it's uh, standards in writing or publishing ethics or anything like that. Um, and because it's such an open field of all sorts of different types of people and different ages, you know, all sort of scrambling towards the same news, do you think Disney is an easy target for armchair reporting? Or, like, what what is it about Disney that makes, um, you know, a YouTuber start a show and, and get a bajillion hits and don't necessarily, like, you know, they've not even went to school for what you do. Like, what the, it feels like the playing field mm-hmm. has been, um, I don't even like the term leveled, but there's just no playing field anymore. No, everyone's playing a different game inside of the same thing. It's a lawless yeah, jungle. Yeah, though, what, yeah. I mean, thoughts on that? You know, uh, I think it's it's because, number one, that Disney has, I think, the strongest fandom. Mm. Um, I because uh, because it's not it's not Star Wars because Star Wars is almost like a single thing. Like, I know it's more than just movies and it, it progressed beyond that. Um, the Disney company covers a lot of things that that is a lot of movie franchises and a lot of theme parks and a lot of television. It's yeah. a lot of media. And so it is very easy to be a Disney fan because all you have to do is connect to several pieces of that. And when there's several hundred pieces, is it that hard to find seven or eight things that you really fell in love with or really enjoy? I don't think it is. Because even even like thinking of Universal, like I, I don't think that Universal has had the same quality standards through their entire existence. But I think like, you know, I, I have several things with them that that allow me to connect to that company and like jaws back to the future. Um, and with Disney, it's so much easier because there is so much more quality content. I think that's why I think there's so many great movies and there's so many great rides and even, even, you know, Joe Idaho loves like several Disney things. Um, you know, it's just very accessible. And I think that's why I think it, 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 media wise, it's, it's the strongest fandom. And I, I, I think it's just because of the size of the company. Yeah, one of the things that I don't think we appreciate enough about a, a sort of the chaos involved with Disney fandom is the fact that every time Disney does a merger, we're also merging fan bases. And all of a sudden, a new yeah. pool of people is sort of drug into an old environment and starts reshaping it and changing it and, and, and you know, teeing some people off. And... I, I think it is such a weird, especially in this last couple of years, um, a, a very evolving and growing sort of thing where it used to be just you were into parks and now, you know, you're because there was no Star Wars. I mean, there was no Disney movies, you know, <laughs> like for a very long, like what Condor Man, like there was not like a thing. And now yeah. there is basically only Disney films. And so you bring in these whole other yeah. crews that um spice up and and change things out and i don't think it's always bad but you're right i think it's a it's an interesting petri dish of people but there's also this there's this library that never mm. dies which other studios have not been able yeah. to do disney figured out some algorithm i mean obviously they, they the movies themselves are they touch people in a way that other studios films do not um and i think that's why things like snow white and dumbo and pinocchio and fantasia these really really right. old movies stay relevant and still move merchandise and that's why even when they had their dark period disney still had all that evergreen stuff to fall back on like they'll always have mickey mouse and they'll always have dumbo and they'll always have alice in wonderland like those those don't go away. And Mary Poppins, you know, those will never go away. And so even when times are bad, there's there's always all this old stuff to fall back on. Let's dig a little deep into the parks. And I, a question for you is um, about that is, you know, the yearly guest sort of – um, I wouldn't say gets the exact same experience, but sort of uh, gets used to a specific type of um, – cast member culture or even, you know, Disney parks culture. But for you, someone who's been reporting uh, over a decade and has, um, you know, been on the ground for five, um, what are some subtle changes about 
Parks culture um, inside of the company uh, that you've sort of seen evolve that maybe the the more casual vacationer wouldn't notice? Uh, I think a lot of things that if older management was still around wouldn't be acceptable are acceptable. You brought up cast members. Uh, One of the things that really bothers me is uh, more so in California, but it happens a lot here too. Um, People talking about their job Mm. loudly in front of guests. Like the thing that makes the reason Disney has the fandom it does is because the the cast and experience is held to a really spectacular standard. And that's why people generally are in love with with the parks. Um, And there are still plenty of cast members who are exceptional and still go above and beyond, even though they're probably not treated as well as they should be by the company. Um, Just a lot of stuff like that. Uh, And then the other thing is. I don't know the cast member social media mm. culture. I don't think the the company was kind of late to the game to come up with an idea of like what's acceptable or not um, for cast members on right. social media. And I feel like I've read or seen a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have. And in running the site, like I, I, one thing that comes to mind is an incident where we posted literally four of the main audio animatronics in the Little Mermaid ride were completely off. They were not moving. The ride is still open. We are going through and, and Ariel's just just immobile. Um, I mean, four figures, four of the mm-hmm. key figures, which should put the ride at a point where you close it. And so we tweeted this in hopes like maybe someone will get around to fix it. But either way, this this is not acceptable. Like I, I for the amount of money people pay to go to a Disney park, if it's I'm thinking about the person in front of me, it's probably their first time on the ride. And they basically think they just went through a ride with yeah. statues of the little mermaid. Um, and so we, we tweeted about this and someone who worked at the attraction basically tweeted back at us a lot of operating guidelines for the attraction. I can't imagine the company wants those right. shared publicly. <laughs> I can't imagine they want you to know the theoretical hourly capacity. Um, at what point the ride has to close? What, what are the operational standards yeah. that have to be reached? The, I, like, and I see that stuff all the time, and I, I, my mind is blown that no one cares. I think at times I feel like an old dude when it comes to certain aspects of Disney culture. Um, whether mm. it be I don't know, Instagram walls or whatever. Um, so I, I thought I'd give you a moment because uh, you're someone who uh, sometimes likes to go full Andy Rooney on a situation. Uh, <laughs> I have become I've become the crotchety <laughs> old man over the last 11 years. It's sad, but true. Beyond the fact that, you know, I think that the site is always looking to progress and, and you know, um, do things that interest um, new technologies, things of that nature. What's something about Disney parks culture you just don't get at all? Instagram. <laughs> well, that's sort of social culture. But um, do you mean like the culture surrounding Disney specifically inside of Instagram or? Well, I mean, it's, there is, yeah, Disney, Disney Instagram is this weird thing. And it's, it's become a business much like this side became the, 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 mm-hmm. you know, the Disney fan sites. Uh, Disney Instagram is, is, and it's weird because Disney Twitter wasn't really one of those things. And Disney Facebook isn't really, but there is, there are businesses and all sorts of things operating out of, out of uh, the Disney Instagram community. Um, and I mean, on, on, a, on a social scale, I don't understand the wall thing either. Um, I mean, it, it takes a nice picture. I get taking a cute picture of yourself. Sure. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Some people um, like to do that. <laughs> that whole world. Yeah. Like the, there's a lot of Disney bounding and some people are spending a lot of money on Disney bounding. And there's some people who do like Disney bounding professionally and, I, my mind is blown. Like my mind was blown that I could do this for a living. Um, but somehow still the concept of getting ad revenue from the site, having traffic, that makes Mm -hmm. sense to me. Um, making money somehow through Instagram by Disney bounding that, that I, I can't put it together. So the issue is not necessarily that it happens, but it's just the fact that literally someone can pay their rent. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wagging my finger. I'm not saying like you people disgust me. That's not at all my, my thought. My, I just completely don't understand and more power to you. I mean, if you can figure out and I mean, I'm, I'm in no different a situation. If you can figure out how to make a living and make yourself happy doing 
something that you can only, you know, that you, you mm. wanted to do that, that, you know, involves your fandom or something you love that that's really wonderful. As we end kind of here, I have two more questions for you. One is you go to the parks, one would say probably almost every day in some form. Um, and I imagine, so, so I see this even as an, someone who's an AP, I remember going on dinosaur with my wife for the 50th time and getting off and, and sort of chuckling and saying like, Hey, do you remember the first time we went on here? And it sort of like left us agape and we were like, what the, you know, what was that? And like, man, I'm a little shaky and like, wow, like that was, just, whoa. And now it's like, uh, it might as well be a walk in the park to ride dinosaur, right? Like you get so <laughs> used to things that are supposed to be spectacular. Um, and yeah. I imagine the idea of reporting on Disney is like this weird curse slash blessing where, uh, you're like, I yeah. gotta go to Disney every day. And then the moment you realize it, that you're going to Disney every day, it's like a twilight zone episode. Um, do you still try to find ways to enjoy it like you did when you were a kid or is that now an impossibility for you? If that was an impossibility, I would have, I would have left this a long time ago. Cause the, the moment I would have felt like this was ruining my enjoyment of probably the thing I, I love most in this world, I would have, I would have bailed. Um, and that was, that was the same fear of like working for the company. Cause obviously like any, other college kid who really, really loved Disney World. I applied for the college program, but my fear kept being that I was going to, you know, I was going to spoil something. Right. And so in the end, I didn't do it. Um, and then even once I moved here, I, uh, or in the, the sixth month I was trying to move here before I actually moved here, I applied for several um, positions with the company. And I was, in the end, I just remember th being really relieved that they didn't work out. Um, I don't want to be on, on that side of it. Uh, and so the same thing with this, where I didn't want, I didn't want it to be a chore to have to go to Epcot and don't get me wrong. There, there are times where, uh, you know, there's a day where I really want to do something in particular and, you know, they started ripping solar cells off the universe energy. And so right. I have to go, uh, you know, um, but I, I think I've found a lot of ways to, to keep, uh, it interesting. I think, um, uh, in relationships, the, the ability to go on, on park dates and still in, you know, and, and that's a time to enjoy. And obviously I, if something, if I notice something, that's a story, like whoever I'm with generally mm -hmm. knows like, all right, he's going to stop and take some photos and make this happen. Yeah. But that's when I'll go do the tourist stuff. So there's a couple days a month where I'll do like a full park day, with like a dining reservation pre-planned and all these things. And then there are other work days, which I, I think it's kind of fun. We have like a, like a, a route we do um, where we do, you know, we'll do like, Oh, do you want to do Sana for lunch today? Yeah, we'll do Sana and we'll do Sana and then we'll go to this park cause this thing's happening. Um, and we'll see what's going on at that park. Um, it, it's, it's a routine, but it's a routine that has made sense and keeps things fresh and interesting. And I think the other thing, when we started this interview, you, you almost went immediately like the donuts or, or cupcakes of the month or whatever. Um, that has managed to keep things fresh. There, there is this uh, – between food, merchandise, and attractions and resorts, um, there is always something new to do. Uh, and I think that does keep things exciting. I don't think a month goes by where we don't have like a new restaurant or, or something something of a larger scale or events – um, Halloween and Christmas and all of those things. It, it stays interesting. There's always something different to do. And I don't, I don't overdo mm -hmm. it. Like I think, um, sometimes I take breaks from attractions. Like I took a year off from Muppet vision hmm. like last year. It's like a fast. Um, <laughs> and I think, yeah, almost. And then like when I finally saw it again after a year, I, I, you know, the show ended and I'm, and I'm sitting there going, yep, I still love Muppet vision. This show is fantastic. And there, that appreciation kind of comes back. If you give the thing some time to breathe and not every attraction needs it. Like, um, you know, splash mountain, I don't get tired of and, and mansion, not so much. And, um, but, but some of them, some of them need a break and, and I give, I give them a break and, and, and not every trip to the park includes attractions. Sometimes it's just walking around people watching, eating lunch. Um, you know, it's, it's like going to your local mall, but when you live in Orlando, you know, theme park can be your local yeah, mall. No, totally. What does the future of WDWNT look like in the next 10 years? What would you like it to be? Um, what I would like, I would like what we have accomplished for Florida, for Walt Disney World. I would like to have that for each of the Disney resorts around the world. Um, that is an interesting challenge. 
in finding the people to make it happen and then finding the audience. Um, but I think that's, that's my, my end goal, um, is, uh, I, I think it, for me, it, it's, I, I always, what keeps all of this interesting for me is to continually keep doing new things. Um, I get bored pretty easily. And so once we do something and I feel like it has succeeded as far as it can succeed or, or it's at the point where I can hand it off. Um, I then like to go try something different. And we've tried lots of different things like news tonight and all kinds of weird things. Um, the fake late night talk show and all. And I love doing those weird things that other people haven't done before and seeing if it's possible, like if anyone will, will watch it or listen to it or if it'll succeed. Um, so expansion beyond Florida and then just some more interesting programming. I'd, I'd like to do a lot more interesting programming if, if time will allow. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming on dream finders. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. And that's it for this episode of dream finders. Thanks so much to Tom for coming on and being my guest. Our podcast artwork is provided by JP Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at WDWNT.com. DreamFinders is hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Tell your friends about the show and please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at DreamFinders at WDWNT.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. DreamFinders is sponsored by Never Grow Up Vacations, the official travel partner of WDWNT.com. Never Grow Up Vacations specializes in trips to Disney destinations around the world, so be like us and never grow up. Head over to NeverGrowUpVacations.com to book your next trip today.